don't buy variegated plants. Thanks so much for watching and follow me on Instagram. Hi, I'm Nick. And if you want your plants to stay metaphorically anemic for aesthetic purposes, you came to the right video. If you clicked on this video to learn how to do a smoky cut crease, you're probably looking for Nikki tutorials. Okay, so I made another video about variegation three slain calatheas ago. Yep, that's me. You don't need to watch it to understand this video, but I'll link it below anyways. It's more the technical and scientific side of variegation. I'm going to eliminate any unnecessary details that are not pertinent to the purpose of this video. A utilitarian application on what was in that video, plus some added information that I have learned since then on owning various variegated plants. The point of this video is to avoid paying copious amounts of money on plants that are going to revert on us or go full albino and subsequently die. Both of which are completely worthless. In the beginning of this video, I will be talking about variegation in Hoyas and a few other plants. However, this video is going to mainly focus on how to identify good variegation in aeroids, i.e. philodendrons, monsteras, syngoniums, etc. It seems to be the majority of the high value variegated plants in the trade. Therefore, I'm going to assume that it's what people have most interest in. Maybe take a few minutes to watch this video before you take out a second mortgage on your home. Or a third, if you just bought that caramel marble. I'd first like to tackle the expression, it's in the DNA, it's in the DNA. What if I didn't know that DNA was an acronym for deoxyribonucleic acid. And I was just going around and I was like, Dna. 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 Yes, that is true in some cases, but with aeroids, it's usually not the case. There are a couple exceptions though. We will go over those, but let's first go over some variegation that does not lack chlorophyll, like a lot of the ones we are interested do. I will also show you how to identify that. A good example of natural variegation with all of its chlorophyll are plants in the Calathea family. That is before they cease to exist in your care. Some plants in the family have a chlorophyllous variegation like Stromanthia triostar, Stromanthia charlie, Cetanthia Liberciana, and there might be a few others, but those are the ones that just come to mind. I think these plants are a great example of variegation that does not lack chlorophyll because of their patternation. In variegation that is genetic and does not lack chlorophyll, you will see lots of repeating patterns, and you can kind of see on this leaf that these lines kind of congregate in pairs of two or three. Besides the transport damage, almost every leaf on this plant looks the same. Here is my Cetanthe setosa. It's, you know, it's doing its Calathea thing and giving me problems and kind of like dying on me. They're here to give you stress. Just remind yourself that and you won't be let down. As you can see, this leaf especially has a very, very regular pattern. I got both of these from Walmart. I live at Walmart. It is the apex of the cultural ecosystem in my community. I got this at Nanthi from a Walmart that was not my local Walmart, so I really like ventured out of my, my nest and I pushed myself. I waded into new waters. Sometimes I'm forced to push myself beyond the acute horizons of my existence when I am struck in with unprovoked cerebral convocations of a fruitless existence. But really, it was a big deal when Walmart came to my community because if you wanted anything besides groceries, you had to drive like 20 miles to get it. Another subsect of genetic variegation that will not go away is blister variegation. This is not done by pigment like we saw in the Calathea family. This is actually done by air-filled pockets in the leaf that catch and refract light. And this is just an anthurium crystallinum. And without the blister variegation, it would just be an inum. My Syndapsis silver lady, that is remarkably underwhelming compared to my Syndapsis exotica that my cat peed in and killed. Thanks for that. Not Moo, if you've been watching for a while. Moo is 
very dignified and behaved. And now I'm stuck with you. Stuck with you, stuck with you, stuck with you. Something I forgot to say with the pigment variegation that also applies to the blister variegation is that they don't usually go through the leaf onto the back. So like with the Pink Princess, a lot of times you can see variegation on the front and then you can flip the leaf over and it'll still be there. With these, it is not present. I do not know the purpose of blister variegation or pigmented variegation as we saw with the Calatheas. However, they must have some type of evolutionary purpose or they wouldn't be there. Therefore, the plant is not going to waste energy putting variegation on the back because usually that's not visible. Another group of plants where variegation is pervasive is begonias. You cannot ignore Costa Farms' crispy icon, Begonia maculata. There are others, but I think you get the drift. So the previous two modes of variegation we discussed had all of their chlorophyll. However, there is genetic variegation that lacks chlorophyll. These generally don't occur in the wild, Philodendron Florida Ghost is actually just a variation of Philodendron Pedanum, which is fully green. Peperomia Pink Lady is just a variation of Peperomia Caporetta, and the fully green form occurs naturally. I have not had the pleasure of owning a Monstera Thai constellation, but I have heard that it is genetically variegated, which is probably why Costa Farms chose that Monstera over the non-genetically variegated Monstera albo-borsigiana. Genetically variegated plants that lack chlorophyll are the only type of variegated plants whose appearance depends on their surrounding conditions, like sunlight and humidity. For the most part, sunlight is the biggest determining factor in how much variegation these plants will have. The more light that you give them, the more intense the variegation will be. Both of these plants were under the eternal sun last winter, meaning uh, the grow light that I had above them that I did not have a timer for because I didn't feel like buying one. The rest of the plants are fine and actually did pretty well because their chlorophyll was not dictated by the amount of sunlight they received for the most part. Mistake, clarification. This is another Paparomia pink lady because the one that I had no longer exists. Both of my plants got so much intense light for 24 hours a day, they completely lost all of their chlorophyll and the leaves on this turned fully white, like white, white. And the other Peperomia Pink Lady I had was all pink. In one of my smarter moves, I decided to remove this Philodendron Florida Ghost from the beacon of achlorophyllity in order to continue its earthly existence. It's still under lights, not 24 hours. Uh, it's looking a little bit too much like me still. It's not a true match. As for how to identify this type of variegation, if it's the entire leaf that is variegated and it changes, then it's probably genetic. Genetic variegation also tends to be dispersed like with the Monstera Thai constellation, there are not gigantic chunks or full leaves of variegation unless you put them under a death ray for 24 hours. Look at her. Also on my Florida Ghost, look at all of this nectar. If I was a moth, Fun fact, philodendrons and other plants produce nectar on their stems in order to attract ants that will defend the plant. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get in. Time for a taste test. This is basically just sugar water. I volunteer to be an honorary ant. It tastes kind of like maple syrup. What if I die like halfway through this video? We are now done with the topic of genetic variegation. We will now proceed to chimeric variegation i.e. the variegation that is pervasive in our irresistible lust for anemic aeroids and financial ruin. Yes, that kind of variegation. According to Google, in a scientific 
view, a chimera is an organism containing a mixture of genetically different tissues formed by processes such as fusion in early embryos, grafting, or mutation. The ones that we are accustomed to are usually due to mutations. I like to think of it as two plants in one. I say it's two plants in one because I think it's an easy way of understanding reversion because in nature, plants are competitive. Have you ever had a wisteria threaten to obscure your entire hydrangea garden after you made the mistake of planting one because you thought it would be romantic? I can tell you from the experience, it was anything but. Beyond my lavender travesty, that should be a band name. I love you. Within every chimeric plant is an analog of my verdant nightmare. That should also be a band name. My Verdant Nightmare is basically a ripoff of My Chemical Romance. But what is Lavender Travesty? Comment below. Two halves of a whole trying to subdue and conquer each other. It's like my friend that absorbed their twin in the womb. I'm sorry for mentioning it. And I'm sorry for repeating it now. As a consequence, you must play the mediator of this leafy battle. Because if this happens, you will either possess the ghost of a monster elbow or something you can find kicking around in the back of Home Depot. It reminds me of the time Mr. B our vice principal at the time, that wasn't vice principal for very long, decided to jump on top of two girls that were fighting on the ground outside of the cafeteria. Like, on top of that, like, on top of them. Like, mysteriously, he disappeared. So that's what a chimera is, don't plant wisteria in your hydrangea garden and don't tackle underage girls. I hope I only had to enlighten you about one of those things. Ultimately, with every chimeric plant, you will have to maintain the variegation somewhat. I am now going to talk to you about the three types of chimeric variegation within plants. That way you can identify plants that are going to give you staple variegation when you're purchasing them. We are Bach and we will now be talking about periclinal variegation. And a little tip for those of you looking for variegated plants, this is the most stable type of variegation besides genetic variegation. The telltale signs of periclinal variegation are two distinct locations of the variegation on the leaf and symmetry. The variegation will either be down the center of the leaf from the petiole down to the tip, or it will be wrapped around the entire edge of the leaf. The variegation will be symmetrical vertically along the midrib of the leaf, so if you see one side of the leaf, it should mirror the other. Fun fact, you will often find that one species of a plant will possess both modes of periclinal variegation. For half example, right here, we have a Hoya Crimson Princess and a Hoya Crimson Princess with a fern. The fern is not for demonstrative purposes. So I do not possess Hoya Crimson Queen, which is the opposite form of this periclinal variegation. So I will put up a picture. Can you see it? Can you see it with your special eye? My brand. Now I will show you the lovely variegation on this one. Look at her, see, see what I'm talking about? This is a really good example. It's almost exactly symmetrical if you're going vertically. Of course, this can revert. It is not reversion free. Basically, you just have to cut out this material as you see it and try and get to the base of the problem, find where it's coming from or else it'll just grow back. So we have this right here that is reverted. There's no variegated tissue left in the stem. It has grown a lot this winter because it is much more vigorous because it has all of its chlorophyll and will completely obscure the plant. Therefore, we must cut it. I'm just going to go right here uh, just because I don't want that to happen again. It might help if you're using better scissors than safety scissors, but these are the only ones I'm trusted with after the, the incident. Well, let's get to it. No fully green leaves should be left on the stem. And this one can now continue its journey in growing a chlorophyllous leaves. Compared to the other foliage, these just grew so fast. I don't think there's any new growth on the variegated portions. So that's why I say make sure you keep on top of this and make sure you remove it because it will get out of control pretty fast. We are done. These are so fun to play around with. Ow, this too, gotcha. I must tell you that this plant was not fully variegated to begin with, like 
this was, and this hasn't given me any issues. I would highly recommend just finding a plant with good variegation to begin with in this type of variegation, or any type of variegation, except genetic, if you can get it to present itself later, or else it'll keep haunting you, like my dead goldfish. No, it's fine. That, dead, that goldfish lived like 10 years. I actually had to bury it because it was so large. It was like this big. We have Hoya Bella Albo Marginata, and the inverse of this is Hoya Bella Luis. I don't know who this man is. Louis Boy. I don't know how it's pronounced. A lot of these plants, I just, I, I butcher because I only read them online. I don't talk to anyone. Also, I don't, <laughs> people like come to me, they're like, so like what plant channels do you watch? And I'm like. We're lying when I'm making them. This also has spider mites because God sent the plague upon me for what I did with the scissors that were not of safety. Yeah! Here is my Hoya Astralis Lisa. Just look at her. So if you've been watching me for a while on YouTube, you would know that I had two pretty large plants as of like this past summer, this past spring. Well, I finally rubbed my two remaining brain cells together and decided to sell both of them before Casa Farms decided to release them in the Trending Tropicals collection. So before I did that, because I still liked the plant and did not want to have to pay for it again, I took a one node cutting off of one of the plants. I decided to take the cutting from the best part of the plant, the tenderloin of the Hoya, if you will, because with chimeric variegation, the variegation you see is the variegation that you get. The plant needs variegated tissue to split and divide and produce more variegated tissue, and same with the regular green tissue. So here is one of the leaves that was on the cutting. As you can see, it is green around the edges and variegated in the center. Pretty much the same with this one, but I didn't want to have to disturb the plant by cutting too far into it. And as you can see, uh, these two leaves pretty much followed suit and so did these and we have good variegation throughout here So I think it was a success. Here is my Manjulopothos, which in my opinion is Periclinal variegation a very weak one. However, just FYI This is the result of a video I made in 2020 if you've been wondering if you've watched that you probably forgot like five minutes after you you watched the video, but here it is. Back to the variegation on this. This one looks like your classic periclinal variegation. This one looks like a deformed Marble Queen pothos leaf. Uh, this one does not want to live. And here we have this reversion. I just want to show you something interesting. Basically, the variegation pattern continues from the stem up into the petiole and gets expressed in the leaf. Conversely, here's a green stem that yielded a green leaf. On to the next type of variegation, and the one that people regularly lose their minds over and spend upwards of four figures on, sectorial variegation. Or sectorial chimeric variegation, but I'm just going to say sectorial variegation, that way this video ends a little bit sooner. This variegation is characterized by irregular chunks of variegation on the leaf. Unlike periclinal variegation, there is no distinct pattern to it. Think of periclinal variegation as your face, you know, generally the same on both sides. Our eyebrows are sisters, not twins. And sectorial variegation is our mouth on our right cheek, our nose where our ear should be, our ear on our neck, our eye on our chin. You know, you get the drift. My whole point is, it's not organized, it can occur anywhere. These plants can also give you fully variegated leaves, which in my opinion don't count as leaves because they can't photosynthesize anymore, but I don't really know exactly what the philosophical interpretation of a leaf would be. I guess we could call them phyto-incidental, para-perpendicular, achlorophyllous vegetal projections. They can also give us a slightly less pansy-ish half-moon leaf. Anyways, this type of variegation is 
very unstable. I'm going to tell you how to pick sectorial variegated plants that are the most stable so you don't waste your money on horticultural snake oil. Let's first start with cuttings because that's how most of these plants are sold. We will first be discussing the importance of the variegation in the stem and then we will move on to leaves if the cutting has a leaf. The most important part of the propagule you should look at is the region near the growth point. If you have what people unfortunately call a wet stick, the growth point will be where the leaf scar is. If you have a cutting with a leaf still on it or the base of a leaf still on it, the growth point may be hidden under the leaf base as it is here or just above the leaf base. If you have a cutting that only has one node or a cutting that has a single leaf, you only have one area where new growth will arise from. Pretty much all aeroids function like this. Some other houseplants we grow, like peperomias, can send out plantlets pretty much anywhere that the plant is cut. Aeroids are not the case. You only have one chance for that node to be on tissue that is both variegated and non-variegated. Otherwise, you will get a ghost plant that is going to be fully elbow and die or a green plant, which you could have just bought for like 1 80th the price. The more dispersed the variegation is in the stem or the less chunky the variegation, the more likely those tissue types are going to be present at that node for the plant to grow from and produce a variegated plant. I think a good stem is like a candy cane, lots of stripes on the outside of variegated tissue, but a main kind of like base of green. Or if you looked at the intersection of the stem, it would be like a nice marbled juicy steak. I'm a vegetarian. I don't really know why I keep using these meat analogies. Maybe I have an iron deficiency. Do I look like it? I'll just blame the camera. What you don't want your cuttings to look like is whale meat. Dark, gross meat with a bunch of blubber attached to it. I know this community likes variegation, like spider mites like to ruin my life, but maybe err on the side of caution and go for like 50 or less percent variegation. I think for most things like 30 is good. Obviously you don't want to go too low or else you risk losing the variegation. This video is taking more sweatshirts than I thought it would. But that's okay, because now you get to see my third grade drawing skills. I'm going to show you on a whiteboard with these dry erase markers what I just described so we can visualize it better. And I'd like to let you know I purchased these myself and on a teacher's salary. If that's one thing I've learned in school, teachers won't let you forget they're on a teacher's salary. What? learned in boating school is okay let's draw the first intersection of the stem here is the stem Circle. that's a stem and all of these bubbles will represent chlorophyllous cells if you can call them bubbles the black bubbles will represent chlorophyll lacking cells. If the variegation looks like that, like we talked about, it's chunky, just like milk, don't buy it. These markers are leaving residue. Why am I still using the crap markers? Goodbye. Let's draw another stem. These are worse. Oh, that was a lot of work for nothing. Was this like left under, oh, this one works. Left under one of the aisles, the black one was. Okay, I need you, I guess. Here's a stem. This is so nice. Is this what it's like to be a Kardashian? It's like snowing pussy willows. Here's the white. I'm going to show you where the growth point is on this one. That's a good area because it has interspersed variegation and green tissue. If it was on this side, which you kind of can't see, or even this side, you would just get green growth from here. And that's, that's gross. Nobody wants just a fully chlorophyllous plant. Finally, the best one. Done. Pretty much anywhere along this stem is good for a growth point to be, so you don't really have to be too worried about that. So I would recommend a variegated stem node wet stick 
what have you, that has variegation that looks like this. The first one I didn't put any growth points on because I just don't think that's good in general and wouldn't recommend buying it. Okay, so that ends our borderline disturbing discussion about wet sticks. Um, we will now move on to cuttings that have the privilege of possessing a leaf. Leaves are a good representation of how much variegation that will be represented in your future plant because the leaf emerges just below where the location of the node is. Therefore, they are going to share a lot of the same variegated and non-variegated tissues. I still think that good variegation throughout the node is still the most important factor. I want you to remember it only takes a small portion of cells to produce an entire leaf, meaning a highly variegated leaf could grow from a very small variegated portion of the stem even if the stem doesn't have variegation in the rest of it. An elbow leaf could start as a few cells and develop into a whole elbow leaf whether or not the rest of the stem is green. A good example of what we just talked about is this pink princess cutting. As you can see, we have lots of burgundy leaves and one very pink leaf. Looks like this leaf is going to be functional as well. Doesn't it sound kind of like dystopian when you say it like that? Like, why are all these leaves photosynthetic? Damn, I just wanted, like, one useless leaf. If nodes were a mode of transportation, I would say they would be an alpaca. Like, riding an alpaca in a snowstorm, up a mountain, on the way to work. So what is the Honda Civic of cuttings? That would be the top cutting. With the top cutting, you have the current meristem or growth point of the mother plant, which means you should generally have the same variegation pattern that the mother plant has. You actually have the most valuable part of the plant because the mother plant cannot grow from that area anymore and has to rely on lateral shoots, as we've discussed, are not very reliable. Because top cuttings are so valuable in the arena of variegation, you should be very careful when purchasing them online or if you have like a shady node dealer in your neighborhood. A lot of people, I mean a lot a lot of people, will sell top cuttings that are either reverting or going fully elbow. You will see the rest of the plant and that is the plant that will be very nicely variegated and the one they are going to keep. The top few leaves are the most important when choosing a top cutting. Those are the most representative of the variegation that you are going to get. Along the same lines, imagine the seller is selling an entire plant. Make sure you check the top few leaves to make sure that the variegation is there because it might not come back. So don't look if it's a larger plant at a couple leaves all the way down at the bottom that have good variegation and be like, well, because of that, it's in the DNA. It's in the DNA. It's not in the DNA, okay? No. It's in the meristem. It's in the growth point. Some people won't even take the cutting off of the plant before they sell it. And I find this in most cases that the plant is going fully elbow. The reason they don't cut it off is because the cutting's gonna die. They just go into the little draw area on their iPhone, draw a red line and they're like, here, here's something that's going to die. Lastly, in our discussion about cuttings, you should feel free to reach out to the seller and ask for pictures of the mother plant if they have it. Okay, so that's it for cuttings. Um, let's go on to the next type of chimeric variegation. This is mariclinal variegation and under no circumstances should you pay a penny more for it than the original unvariegated form. This variegation is very random and generally only occurs on one to a few leaves of a plant. Beyond that, it's, and it is devoid of value because it is not stable or propagatable whatsoever. I did see a post on Reddit of one person that got a Monstera Deliciosa at a grocery store. It had one spot of variegation like this big. This only sought to validate people's chimera of finding a Monstera elbow in a grocery store. This is just so campy. Many people here may not use the word chimera regularly in their vocabulary. In the horticultural sense, it's what I just described to you. However, it also has many other uses. The one I just used in relation to Reddit is a thing that is hoped or wished for, but is in fact illusionary or impossible to achieve. That being finding a monster elbow with staple variegation at the grocery store. Because if there was, I would be hauling my butt to Walmart as we speak. I love how campy that conversation was, the chimeric chimera. 
As you would know, I am all in for the camp and being overzealous about things in general. In my last video about variegation, I showed you this on my philodendron lemon lerm or lemon lime. Most of these chimeras look really stupid and insignificant, unless you're like obsessed with variegation. <laughs> no one's obsessed with variegation, <laughs> like variegation. So you're probably asking me, Nick, on a cutting, how can I tell if variegation is mariclinal? I can't see the rest of the plant. It's not there. So like, how is this different than sectorial? Well, this is actually less looking at the attributes of the plant and more just doing some research. Like I said, it usually manifests in very insignificant small amounts of randomly placed variegation, in which case I wouldn't recommend you buy this anyways because you could lose the variegation very easily if there's not much of it. The only way to figure this out if this is actually a substantial amount of variegation on a single leaf or a couple leaves or whatever is to do research outside of actually looking at the picture of the plant. The first thing I would ask myself, is this an actual cultivar of a plant or is it generally well known in the community? If you can't find it and you don't really see anything else like it, don't buy it. Sellers will make completely random names and post them online as if it's a thing. The names are usually food derived. Um, someone might find a tiny speck of variegation on their Syndapsis Truvii pot that they got from Walmart, Costa Farms, and say it's Syndapsis Truvii French Vanilla Creme Brulee Variegata. No, it's not reproducible. It is not a cultivar. Thank you. It's always food. Why is it always food? Like, is everyone starving in this community? My next tip is don't shop for aeroids on an empty stomach. Beyond that, you do your research, let's say you're still not sure, contact the person and ask them for a picture of the mother plant. And let's say they're like, I don't have the mother plant. Well, we live in the 21st century and we have camera phones. And if they're selling something for like $300, I think they know where it came from and they could contact the person they got it from. They didn't find a cinnamon candy apple, Monstera adansonii, narrow form variegata lying on the side of the freeway. Okay, it didn't happen. Like it, it didn't fall from the sky. They found it at Lowe's on a plant that was labeled beautiful home decor. Ready everyone? Let me hear you say, we're not going to talk about Nick's fourth sweatshirt. We are now going to look at examples of sectorial variegation in my Syngonium podophyllum albo and not in the conventional propagation way. We're going to turn it into sushi more or less. So I'm going to switch the cameras and I will see you in a second. Okay, so I don't think I possess the mental acuity to be handling these, but um, we need to chop up some syngoniums very precisely. So uh, it's happening. We're going to start with the reverting ones I stuck in here because that's interesting. I'm going to select some cuttings that I just threw in the space because I couldn't leave them on the plant because they were reverting and they've been sitting here all winter. I will first take out this one and we've got one fully green leaf and one fully elbow leaf. Let's cut them apart. So much for that note. I don't think I did it right. We'll cut off this leaf. I don't know what this is showing us, but it's showing us something. Okay, we now possess the two different plants. Here is the white part. Here is the green part. So this ended up being all of this tissue. This tissue right here turned into this. The green stopped at the node, so I wanna take a look at that. Stupid roots. Well, this one's all white. There's that example. 
we have a half mooner right here. I want to cut down here because it looks fun. Doesn't that look fun? Fun. This is my idea of fun. Look at these, they look like candy canes. This is so exciting. We must cut the rest of this note in half because we have to. I don't see much in the center. We're going to cut this half moon leaf along its variegation. For science, green side, elbow side. Well, the leaf starts down here-ish. We're gonna zoom you in. We're performing surgery. Oh! Do you think it'll survive? No? Good. This part is hard to tell. Oh, crap. Oh. No! Okay, we're gonna keep going. From the opposite direction. I cut it up there. This is, ugh. Okay. We're gonna keep the white. Nope, we won't. These are, this is so sharp. Well, <laughs> that happened. We at least got the leaf and they can be my ears. I don't think we have to go into the big one. Um, we got what we wanted, but I wanna just rip this elbow one up. I wanna just... <laughs> It's the Syngonium heart instead of the artichoke heart. Let's unroll it. Let's do what everyone secretly does and like messes up their leaves because they're impatient and wants to see the variegation pattern on the next leaf before it unfurls completely. Remember, always cut towards yourself and do it next to your neck. I'm going to cut up this pink princess because screw this pink princess. Let's get the base first. Oh, God. Come on. Here is our pink princess. Beautiful, beautiful. Look at that variegation. Oh my God, all the people on Instagram are going to wet their planties over it. I just want to start by taking all of the leaves off of it. Just deleafing it. Oh, that one. We have a wet stick. We will come back to this. Look at all of these burgundy leaves that came out of this, except this one giving us some false hope, but the rest of them are burgundy. Burgundy, burgundy. Okay, I don't really know what the purpose of that was, but it happened and I don't feel bad about it. It was pretty cathartic, <laughs> to be completely honest. Let's show you this under my macro lens and see some like cool stuff, I think. Science is just cutting stuff up, right? Right? Stab, 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 die! So I just wanna show you this pink princess here and show you the variegation that's on the stem right here. Apologies for the shakiness and part chihuahua. And it goes up into the stem. As you may be able to see, what we can do with one of the leaves is we can locate where it goes by lining up the variegation with the stem. You can see we've got the variegated region right here. We have this pink region right here. This is not variegation. This is just where the tissue is thinner, so it looks lighter. Do not think that this little right here is variegation. It's not. Well, Let's cut her up. Ew, ew, ew. What that? That's disgusting. That is disgusting. Look at the vermigation right here. Not as distinct as I showed you, but you can tell this part's dark. This part is pink. Okay, more cutting. Let's continue cutting this. 
What if I like cut into it and, and someone was like, Ugh! it looks like a bee. I think all the pigment is just getting everywhere and it's making it impossible for us to see what's going on. So I don't, I don't really know what to tell you with this one. We will now make this into bite-sized pieces. I love it. Loving it. Living for it. Live. Laugh. Love. Look at this green portion. Just follow it up. Don't focus there. Look at her. Guys, oh my god, look at my blood clot. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Oh. If you look close enough, you can see my bad choices. There. Back with your brethren. I think... Just, ooh, so clean. Is this sacrilegious? ASMR. <laughs> it looks like one of those nail tools. Do you want to make a heart? I'm butchering this heart. One side is bigger than the other, but I heard that's normal. It's a heart to my lover. Love you. Reap. If you're wondering how a pink princess leaf rips, it rips like this. Let's open the leaf to see if it had any variegation. And it has exactly none. This is why I don't F with these pink princesses. I must show you our little Syngonian elbow pinwheels. They're so cute. Look at the little dots there in the center. This is the xylem and the phloem. And then here's the variegated tissue and the non-variegated tissue. Let me see if I can zoom in more. Wing, 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 open it. You can kind of see the cells. I think we're done with our demonstration, I think. Okay, that's the end of this very long video. And that's all you need to know about variegation. Simple, right? Or you could just buy something that's interesting that's not variegated. Instead of hinging your mental health to the condition that your philodendron puts out a pink leaf this month. Karen, I've noticed you've been a little testy. Is something wrong? It was all green. I don't know how to respond to that. So that's it guys. You should definitely like and comment for the amount of sweatshirts that I wore in this video. Consider supporting me on Patreon so I can buy more sweatshirts or buy me a coffee for a one-time sweatshirt payment. I promise that 0% of the proceeds will go towards variegated plants. Do you want to see my sweatshirts? This sweatshirt that people always get confused about the logo that's on it, it's stitched on like this. This, oh wait, that's not a sweatshirt. This can die. That's it. I forgot one. I got this in Miami. It's in the back because I try and forget about this trip. It did not have to do with tequila, surprisingly.